just this is in the pretty much the same sequence that we were working this semester. Okay, so for starters, let's take a look at this. We're looking at variable types. Variable types came up first in this course because the type of var understanding the difference between different types of variables, how measurements are made. You know, I'm, I'm going to post a TED lecture, a link to a TED lecture where um, there's a mathematician makes an argument and, and uh, an educator who's a mathematician makes an argument that when you go to school and you start to take more advanced math courses, the progression is from basic math to algebra to geometry and, and the end point is all moving towards calculus. That's the direction that, that they're actually moving towards in terms of like getting you ready to take calculus. His argument is, is that nobody uses calculus in, in generally in real life unless you're an engineer and you're doing special kind of work and stuff like that. He thinks that it should be geared so that the end point is probability and statistics because that's what everybody needs to understand in real life and work and business in, in public health and so on and so forth. So it's interesting. I'll, I'll post that later on. I was just looking at that today. But at any rate, we started with variable types. We started with them because it's important to understand the difference between these different kinds of data that we're going to be collecting. So how many of you guys are okay with that, pretty much? Right? Are there any issues? I know sometimes discrete numerical can confuse people a little bit. So discrete that doesn't have a fraction? Like it can't be an it, it has to be. A, it, discrete, for starters, means that it's an integer, right? It's not one point something. It's just an integer. It's a count, right? So, for instance, how many toes do you have? Ten. You know, how, how, how many toes does your cat have, right? Cat has 20 toes, right? Hemingway's cats in Key West are famous for having six toes on each toe, so they have 24 toes, right? So, so I mean, but that's an interesting, that's a discrete cat. How many siblings do you have, right? Brothers and sisters, oh, I have four, I have one, I have none, and so on and so forth. How many cups of coffee did you drink today? If you look at that from the perspective of whole cups of coffee, right? That's a discrete numeric integer. If you start to describe it fractionally, like I had one and a half cups of coffee, or I have one and three quarters, and then it's no longer discrete. Now it's a numerical variable, right? So how many cups of coffee did you have? I had three today. How many you have tomorrow? Two. How many did you have the day before? Four. Uh, what's the average number of cups of coffee that you have per week? Oh, well, now that's going to be a fractional number when you find an average. Could be 3.7. Could be now that, that becomes a numerical variable. That's really the difference. Personally, I don't think going forward it makes too much difference practically for you guys. Yes. Is it 3.7? That's a numerical variable. Like anything that's on a scale is a numerical variable. Anything where that scale has meaning within the scale that's the same at one end of the scale at the other end of the scale. Like for instance, um, uh, if your blood pressure is 120, right? That's really referring to 120 millimeters of mercury, how much weight of mercury will hold up to pressure, right? Now, uh, it's not really 120, right? It's 120 because that's what the digital instrument comes up and says. But what is it really? It could be 120.01, could be 119. It's really a numerical scale. Even though it looks like an integer, it's just because it's been rounded, right? That's a numerical or scale, scale of variable. So just to give you a hint that Gee, this this idea of discrete discrete numerical variables <clears throat> is not going to be that important to us in the future. When you go to SPSS and you go over the type of variable, it gives you only three choices: numerical, no, I'm sorry, scalar. It calls numerical scalar, scalar, nominal, or uh, ordinal. Now, the difference between ordinal. Now, you could have a number. You could have a number like one, five, seven, nine, but it could represent something. Like very frequently on S in SPSS, we, we summarize, we describe data, nominal data, using a number. For instance, one might be male, two might represent female, right? It's still a categor categorical variable, a nominal variable because it's a name, but you are representing it using a number. But that's not, a no not really a number as far as statistic is concerned. It's still an identification of an object, a nominal variable. Um, now, the, one of the big differences between a scalar variable and an ordinal variable is, is that within the variable, within the values for the variable itself, the measurements may not be the same. They have order, but they may not have meaning in terms of the differences. For instance, 
uh, pain scale, which is the one we always bring up first, right? So pain scale, if I say uh, my pain level is six, right, uh, uh, because I have to make the test up, right? We don't know your pain scale may be eight because you have to take the test, right? So, so your pain scale is higher than my pain scale. But to be honest with you, you don't know for sure because my six may be different than your six or seven. So it's not really like measuring like uh, mercury, millimeters of mercury. Yes. That would be an ordinal variable. The pain, the pain would be ordinal because it has num it has has uh, it has order like like if you ask someone nine well nine is if, if you ask somebody what's your pain level is nine oh here's two aspirin right I'm gonna come back in a half hour what is it now it's three right so it has order now it's less than it was before but you can't you can't really measure how much less you just know that it's on that scale it's less you know that three is less than four you don't know if the difference between three and four is the same as the difference between seven and eight, right? So in other words, there might be a bigger difference between seven and eight than there is between three and four. You only know the order, right? So so, so that's really the big difference there. There's an answer sheet for this. So you can go back over these and you, it'll tell you what the right answer for all of these are. But I mean, that's really the place where most people run into the issue is with the screen and so on and so forth. Okay, we're recording, so you guys will be able to catch up on this. The only thing we talked about so far was ordinal and nominal variables and so on. Yes? Uh, I'll fix that so you can see the answers. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix that so you can see all of the answers. And then we can, you said we can go back. Yes, even though I've given you the answers, I want you to go back and then redo it. You don't have to do it now. You can do it anytime in, in the semester. I just want you guys to keep up and at least attempt all the homework. So right now, uh, depending on what class you're in, um, uh, uh, there's a homework assignment 3A and 3B. Now, I've made the due date the same day as the exam is, right? So for some of you guys, that's only four or five days. But you don't have to get 100% on it. I want you to do it because I want you to Attempt it because some of that material, as you're going to see now, is going to be on the test. Oh, I mixed those up. Then I mixed it up for the which class are you in? You're in 600 or 611? 610. You, you guys are in 610, and 610 it says, it says, yeah, yeah. No, hang on a second. But yeah, let, for the, you guys that are in 610, you're really an online class. The way the exam works for the online class, I'm going to make it available on Tuesday, just like we would have regular class. I'm going to make the exam available on Tuesday. You have all week to do it. You have until Sunday night to do it. Yes. You, you have, no, hang on a second. You, you got two shots at it. You have... You have you can you can start anytime you want during between Tuesday and Sunday night, right? Within reason, and you have three hours from the time you start. It's timed, so it's just like an exam. You're going to sit down somewhere quiet where nobody's going to disturb you. No dogs barking, no kids running into the room. You're going to sit down somewhere where you can work, where you have all your materials available to you. You have three hours to do the exam. When you're done, you just hit submit. If you don't hit submit, Within three, if you're still working on it, if the three hours are going to submit itself, right? It's gonna, it's gonna. Now it will tell you. You'll get, re, you'll get feedback that that these these this question is wrong or right. So you'll know which ones are wrong or right. You'll get a second chance to take the test. And so you don't have hours, and another three hours. And another three hours. Yeah, it'll be exactly the same. So in other words, you'll see which ones you got wrong, and you can say to yourself, well, gee, I need to review that material. It won't get. It won't give you the answers. Uh, you know. Yes. Let me just. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Either one. You don't have. If you get. If you do. If you do it one time and you're satisfied with your grade, you don't have to do it a second time. It's not required. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, the stuff we just went over with the normal distribution and the binomial distribution. And, and we're going to go over a little bit of this today, and we'll also go over it on the during the review session on Saturday as well. Okay, So so for you guys that are brick and mortar, 
students, like you're actually got showing up in class and stuff like that. You guys have you're going to do it in class and have the whole period in class. You're going to have that one shot while you're in class to do it. The online guys a little bit, you know, have that other option. Of course, I won't be in the room to answer questions for you when you when you're taking the brick and mortar guys. You know, have that advantage that if there's some confusion over a question, yeah. but you can always email me also between your tries. Oh, you know, you, there's a typo in here. It doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, so on and so forth. So you got, you got a shot at doing that. So for some of you, it's going to be, you know, for you guys that are strictly online, you have that whole period until Sunday night to do it. I wanted to make sure that, you know, because I don't know what your schedules are like. We don't have a set meeting period. So I can't just tell you a certain time is a test. Right. And also, I don't know what your situation is during the week. You may do all your work on weekends and not be available during the week. So I wanted to make sure there were two weekend days when you could do it. But that's the deal. You get two shots at it. Uh, that's I did it for another reason, too, because inevitably somebody messes up and, oh, no, I hit it too soon. But you have that second shot to do it as well. Okay, won't give you any answers. Tell you which ones are right and wrong. So so to give you a little bit of it. You have a little bit maybe a tiny advantage over the guys that are doing it brick and mortar because, you know, you'll at least know where you need the extra help. But that means that you, you need to spend a little time and go back and try and figure this stuff out. Okay. Make sense? Okay, good. All right, let's get back to work. Now, you remember we had that president's graph? That was a real stinker. I'm never going to use that graph again. But we're still going to have a problem that's similar to that because we we need to another. I'm trying to give you a little bit of background why we want to do this stuff with category, with the variable types and so on. Okay, the reason here is we want you to understand how histograms work, how histograms and bar charts and stuff like that work because we're going to be communicating a lot of this data using charts and graphs. So we have one here. That in this problem, which says emergency room data, this is the number of patients that were treated per day for a number of days in a particular hospital. Okay, now always on the left hand side is the frequency. Frequency just means the number of times that that occurred. And if you look at this, each one of these represents a day. So on this particular first day, um, um, uh, we, for the first two days, we have nobody in the emergency room. The third day, we had two people. For the fourth day, we had five. Uh, the uh, uh, sixth, uh, fifth day, we had two, and so on and so forth. The height of the bar indicates the frequency. Okay, everybody comfortable with that? Well, once we get past that, now we have a few issues. Okay, now presumably, assuming this is right, there's 50 people. There's a total, if you add them all up, the number of people in these bars, uh, there's 50. There's 50 people here. In, in, in fact, in Excel and SPSS, you could actually have it when you summarize the data this way. You can actually have the number on the top of the bar representing how many people are represented within that, make it a little clearer. Okay, what percentage of individuals here? Oh, wait a second. Am I reading the right one? Problem, oh, problem B. Okay, problem A is up here. Okay, uh, da -da, for 30 days, number of patients arriving, at least one patient was treated every day, da -da -da, list of 30 numbers. Each number representing the number of patients. So the below's histogram. How many days were there more than eight patients treated in this emergency room clinic? Yeah, yeah, none, right? None were more, never more than eight. The most there was on any particular day. I can't read, you know, I, it's, it's kind of small on my computer here. Let me see if I can't blow this up a little bit more. Let me see if I can't read the bottom chart. Okay, one number, number rotation. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of silly, right? Yeah, six number treated treated per day. Oh, hang on a second. I misinterpreted the graph, didn't I? Okay, this is the number of patients treated per day, right? So there were there were uh, 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 there were uh, on these days there were two patients treated, right? Uh, uh, so so so. The number of there are eight patients treated per day on three days, right? There were nine patients treated per day on three days also. So this frequency is the number of days, right? Okay. I kind of jumped to conclusions there. The question was what? I'm sorry, go back to the On how many days were there more than eight patients treated in this emergency room clinic? This is a month's worth of data for the emergency room. 
And the reason I realized why I, I was misinterpreting it, because it said there were no days when there were no patients treated, right? So this was zero and one couldn't refer to the number of patients. It could only refer to the day number of days, right? So, so on two days, there were only two patients. Uh, uh, on one day, there was many as, as 13 patients. So all of these days, three days here and so on and so forth, everything from here up represents days that patients were treated. Okay, yes. Yeah, well, let's say three, three, one, one, and one, right? So we got six, seven, eight, nine, nine days, right? There were nine days. Okay, let's now, now let's start with this one. This is a different one. This is, this is, let's see, the bar chart of body weights for 50 individuals. So there's 50 people represented here. Each bar represents a person's weight, they, how many people had that weight. So people that were between 100 and 105, and 105, 110, 110, 115, and so on and so forth. Okay, so our question here is, uh, what, uh, what percentage of individuals weigh more than 140 pounds? Well, how many people were here? 50, right? How many of those 50 people weighed more than 140 pounds? Well, we have, is that seven? That looks like seven to me. Seven and five. So seven and five is 12. So 12 out of 50 people, or 24%, out of 50, right? It says 50 individuals. Now, now, if, you, if I didn't give you 50 individuals, you could have determined how many people were represented here by adding up 4 and 4 and 5 and 5 and 3 and so on and so forth. Okay. Isn't it 12 days? That, yes, it is 12 days. Okay. Oh, let me mute, mute again. Okay. So we do have somebody online that can hear us. They 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 sprung up in the chat group. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, well, you might. Know, I'm not going to do that. That oh, caused yeah. too much problems. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. And and also, if I ask for a calculation for quartiles, I'll tell you whether I want you to use Excel or SPSS for it. So that way, we, we don't have to worry about the number of different methods that we might be, what method to choose, and we get, we'll get the same answer and stuff like that, okay? So yeah, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try and be as straightforward as possible so we don't have too much confusion on the exam. Okay, sometimes confusion is nice on, on, on exercises and homeworks because confusion means that you take a closer look. Like I got this one wrong when I first looked at it. So we took a closer look and we understood it better. Yes. This one again? Yeah, okay. So what this represents is the number of patients that were in an emergency room on, on each given day. In other words, over 30 days, we, we recorded on, on the first, it was, there was so many patients. On the second, on the third, on the fourth, on the fifth, how many uh, they were there. So this represents how many days, how many of those 30 numbers that we recorded, that 30 days, how many days had patients that were that number of patients. Yes. Yeah, because that's the, the worst, busiest day in this emergency room only had six patients. Right? Okay, so. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, I misled you again. The, the, uh, we had on, on, we had six patients on six days. So, so on, on two days, we had two patients. On five days, we had three patients. On, uh, on uh, let's see, let's, 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 uh, on, on um, one day, we had five patients. We only had five patients once, once during that month. We only had 11, 12, or 13 patients on each, of, each, of one, each one day, right? And we never had 14 patients. And we never had one patient. We never had zero patients. So imagine this, imagine a list of 30 numbers representing the number of patients that turned up in the emergency room, right, uh, for that whole day. So you have 30 numbers, uh, first day five, second day three, third day two, so on and so forth. Oh, no, on one, uh, yeah, on, on, yes, on one day we had 13 patients, exactly. That was the busiest day, exactly. And the height of the bar represents how many days that that number occurred. 
another question about how many days were more than eight. Yep. So you would start counting from the actual nine. Yes, exactly. Nine, nine, ten. Six. Yep. And then three more. Three more. Nine. Yep. Exactly. Is it after eight? After eight. More, it says more than eight. That's going to come up with the bino, bino, binomial distribution also. Nine, nine days. More than eight. Right, we have nine. Nine has, you have three days when there were nine patients, three days when there were ten patients, and three days where you had one patient on each day. So three, three, and three. Or if you want to look at it this way, three, three, one, and one, and one. Yeah. See, that can, these can be a little bit, uh, con they can be a little bit confusing. But I mean, what are you uncomfortable with there? Yeah, three. So there, there were nine patients on three days. There were ten patients on three days. That's six. There was one patient on, uh, on yeah, one, one, and one. Right, so that's fine. Okay, good. Let's get away from that before we get more confusion. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me go back to 200 on this. Okay. Okay, so now the next thing we covered was descriptive statistics. Okay? We, we talked about descriptive statistics. Now, now, going back to the category types that we were dealing with, when we deal with nominal variables like gender, what kind of descriptive statistics do we usually do with something like gender? I'm going to open up Excel. Uh, gender, we're just, we're just counting frequencies, right? Like, in other words, how many males, how many females? I'm going to open up SPSS also. So with gender, we're usually going to... In SPSS, we go to descriptive statistics, frequencies. Because with gender, we want to know, okay, what about a hair color? How many brunettes? How many redheads? How many blondes? How many and so on and so forth? Uh, um, with uh, left-handedness, how many, how many right-handed? How many left-handed? How many ambidextrous? Right? We want to know the numbers. We might draw a pie chart. We might draw bar graphs that show, well, this is how many uh, left-handers. This is how many right-handers. This is how many people are ambidextrous. So with frequency, with, with descriptive statistics, nominal, nominal variables, uh, we're dealing with uh, frequency. When we talk about numerical variables, that's where things get interesting. Now we're talking about functions like where, you know, like the, the numbers can have a distribution a spread. So uh, many naturally occurring distributions are distributed so most people are in the middle and relatively fewer are at the extremes. Like, for instance, for weight, most people are a certain range of weights. A few people are very low, a very, very much lower weight. A few people are very much higher weight, but most people are in the middle, right? And as you get further away from the middle, you get fewer and fewer people. So you get you can get that histogram. Instead of that histogram, uh, okay. Instead of that histogram looking like this, this really doesn't have much structure, this, because it's not really normal, very normally distributed. But weight might be normally distributed. Right? So, so uh, uh, when we start dealing with uh, 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 numerical statistics, we want to get a handle on which the, where's the middle, right? Because in other words, oh, you know, what's, what's the weight of people in this population? How, many, uh, how much do people uh, in Norway weigh compared to people in America? <coughs> Well, the first thing we might want to compare is what's the average person in Norway way? What's the average person in the United States way? So we have some measure where we can compare one middle to the other middle. And of course, the median is another way of describing the middle, right? Just a little bit different because it's the actual middle value, or the middle value for that person, for that population, where the mean is a numerical average, like an average for a test or something like that. But it is, both of them describe the middle of that distribution. The other thing we might want to know is, well, you know, Norway, maybe Americans have, Americans' uh, average weight is 150, Norwegians' weight is 150, but gee, maybe the spread is different. 
maybe almost everyone in Norway is very close to the center. So the, the spread of weights in Norway is 140 to 160 pounds. But maybe in the United States, we have the same mean, but maybe the distribution is much different. Maybe it's spread out over a much wider range. Maybe it goes from 100 to 300 pounds. So it's very spread out where this other population is very narrowly defined. So there's two things that we're interested in. It's the middle and the spread, how variable it is. The middle is mean and median, right? And the spread is variance, standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance, uh, uh, the range, the percentiles, the interquartile, that nasty thing, the interquartile rates, that kind of stuff, right? So let's take a look at these numbers here. We have, we have five numbers here that we're asking you to work with. Probably I'd give you a bit, a bit more. I might actually give you a file that contains the numbers. But right here, they're just listed. So I'm going to just copy them here. So this is heart rates. And, and what we're asked to do is calculate the mean and median heart rate for these five patients, just exactly the variables that they, the uh, values that we're talking about. Discover the sec uh, discovering the second a patient's heart rate was misrecorded and should have been 140 instead of 40, uh, recalculate both the mean and the median of the corrected data. Uh, does this have, this have a greater impact on the mean and the median? So I'm going to open up Excel. Okay, you can work along with me if you want. Okay, again, you have the answers to these, but uh, we're actually going to sit here and go through some of the solutions. So we'll whatever we don't get done today, we're going to pick up with on Saturday. Okay, so I'm just going to paste this in here so I can see the numbers, but I'm going to redo them over here. 150, 40, uh, 120, uh, 136, and 104. Okay, so I'm going to calculate the mean. And the median. Okay, and we know we have functions built into Excel. I can hit equals and type in average for mean since it doesn't actually call it the mean. And as soon as I hit parentheses, it prompts me that it needs the list of numbers. So here's the list of numbers. I can click in and drag in order to get that range of numbers. And the average is 110. I can do the same thing for median. Okay. And you notice 120, right? Well, what do we got? We got 40, 104, or less than 120, 136, 150, or more than 120. So you can see visually 120 is the middle number, right? But the mean is actually a numerical average, right? So they're a little bit different than one another. They're close, but a little bit different. Now, let's say that 140 was 140, or 40 was really 140. Okay, and actually, I'm, I'm actually sorry that I, I'm going to take that. I'm going to paste it as a value in there so we can see them change. I'm going to say I just want the values. So, so, so I just pasted that in there so they're numbers. They're not a function. But what's going to happen here, since I, I referenced those cells instead of, instead of just doing the average, when I change this number, we'll see a change in those two numbers. So I'm going to put a 140 in there, hit enter, and let's see what happens to the mean and the median. Okay, the mean changed to 130, right? And the median changed to 136, right? So now, you know, I don't love this particular problem. I don't, I don't think it demonstrates what we were interested in all that much. So the mean changed 20. The median changed less than the mean did. The mean, the median is more resistant to change than the mean is. I'll bet you there's going to be a question like that on the exam, right? What does that mean? That means if, if I really had a list of a lot of people here and and uh, 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 let's say that they were let's say we had we had we took everybody's SAT uh, SAT score in this room and uh, we found the average and the median for everybody's SAT test in this uh, G R I'll code G, where G R I is let's say G R E test in this room right I, I don't know what the scale is these days but let's say it's fourteen hundred let's say thirteen hundred. Okay, now somebody comes in, we got a new person comes in here, and his average, he was a really smart guy, he's good at tests, his was 1,800, right? So he was way more than anybody else that was in the room originally. When I take the average, the mean is going to change dramatically. But the median, well, that can only change one person, 
right? It might it might nudge up to the next person in the middle or the, the next lower person, but it's not going to change enormously dramatically because it's defined as the middle person. And if you get one more really smart person in there, it may not even change at all. It may that may still be the middle person even. So right? saying more with just the meaning it's not going to it's change. It's not going to change as much as, as the mean. mean the change. mean is more likely to change if there are extreme values. Okay, if, if they're, uh, yes? Question. Um, in his Oh, the mode. Yeah. Okay. You know, mode's, mode's kind of a tricky thing also. Like, for instance, with this list of numbers here, is there a mode? Yeah. No. Yeah, you know, you don't, in real life, real life, I think in the mode, that you're more likely to come across that when you look at a histogram and you see it kind of doing something like that with two, two peaks or something like that. You say to yourself, maybe there's something about this data that makes it bimodal. Maybe there's really two groups in here instead of really one group, one, two populations combined instead of one population. So, so it's more kind of thing that you might recognize graphically or something like that than something that you might use as usefully as you use the median or the mean, right? You might see something like we sh if we in, in the uh, in the uh, uh, if we show you like on the homework, there was one problem where we show you a bunch of graphs and ask you which ones were the normal distributions, which ones were they skewed, in which direction were they skewed, and which ones were, what, what were these, and the ones that, the other ones were like bimodal, right? You could see them with two. You might get something like that. I, we, I probably wouldn't even bother to ask you to calculate a mode, because in a lot of distributions, you may not have, especially numerical distributions. If you took 50 people and took their blood pressures, you might not get more than a, one or two people out of 50 that have exactly the same blood pressure, right? So, so it, yeah, it's not as useful as a measurement as some of the others. So I won't worry about that too much. Okay. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Uh, ba. In the 1986 the Federal Reserve sampled 4,000 households to estimate the overall net worth of a family, excluding some, excluding some of the outliers, Donald Trump, whatever, Right. They reported the summaries, uh, the summaries, four thousand and one hundred and forty five thousand. One of these was the mean and one was the median. OK, which one do you think was the you know, which one do you think uh, in the, knowing the United States, which one of these would you think is the mean and which one do you think is the median? Yeah, the, the, uh, the median would be for uh, excuse me, the median would be forty four thousand. And the average would be 144,000 because people that are making a lot more money, you know, pull the average up. Yeah. Yep. Right. So that, that that's, you know, that's kind of another indication of like an understanding of how the mean and the median work. Okay. Okay. So uh, suppose that 3% of the population in a given community. Now, we're, now, the next thing we started to talk about. And now, just to show you that if we were interested in calculating the standard deviation here, right? Now, I'm not going to add. Remember, we did that exercise where we actually went through, you know, x minus x. But we're not going to bother with that, right? That was a demonstration of where it came from. Because a lot of people, they do your standard deviation. They've never done that x. If you didn't do that exercise, you wouldn't understand how it was, you know, where this funny thing came from, or where sum of squares came from. So let's say standard deviation. Uh, for these numbers, okay, it's going to be 18. That gives you a measure of the variability. So if I change this back to 40, what's going to happen to the standard deviation? It's going to get bigger or smaller? It's going to get great. It's going to be bigger, right? It's going to be bigger because the standard deviation doesn't measure the mean or the median. It measures the variability, how spread out it is. So now by changing this to 40, it's more spread out. So instead of 18, it's going to be 42. So the standard deviation is spread, right? And the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. I'm not going to bother to calculate the variance because we're more interested in the uh, standard deviation. Now, how about range? The range is just the, mean, the minimum, right? Because there is a function here for minimum, right? So the lowest value is 40. And the maximum is 150, I would guess, right? And the range is just the difference between the two, which is 110. 
Okay. So interquartile range, right? That, that I'm not going to do that with this number. So that really doesn't mean much with these numbers, right? Because there's only five numbers. But the interquartile range is the percentiles. Now, the percentiles represent how many people are within each range. Like, in other words, the 90th percentile means 90% of the people are below that, 10% are above that. So if I had 100 people, if I took the, uh, 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 the GPAs, the grade point averages of 100 people, right? And, uh, and I wanted to know what the 90th percentile was. Not, I, uh, that number would be, would be a point where 90 of the people are less than that and 10 of the people are more than that, right? And, it, and, and if, I w if instead I was working with 3,463 people, 90% of those 364,000 people are below that number and 10% are above that. So the percentile still represents that difference in the groups of people. Okay. If I wanted to know um, uh, the 50th percentile, what's another way of uh, describing the 50th percentile? 50% 50 of the people below and the median, right? The median is the 50, 50th percentile. There you go. And the interquartile range is, I'm going to go back to that group of 100 people. The interquartile range is the middle 50%. So that's going to be, the, it's going to be the, the lowest quartile or the lowest 25%. Quartile being four quartiles, right? Uh, the lowest quartile is, is the lowest 25%. So that's from the 25th person down. The highest quartile, the fourth quartile, is the highest 25%, 75% up. So the, the interquartile range is from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. It's the middle 50% of the people. Okay. And uh, 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 we know that that's also that box that's formed by the uh, box plot. That box represents 25th percentile at the bottom, 20, uh, 75th percentile at the top, and that black bar in the middle is the median, not the average, 50th percentile. And then those little lines that come up and feather at, and into those little thin feathers represent the range, the minimum and the maximum. Okay, let's go back here. I'm sorry. Yes. The 40 is the minimum. 150 is the lowest number. This is the highest number. So th that from there to there is the range, which is 100. And it's the difference, 110. They define it as the number, as the difference between the two. Okay, so let's see what we got next here. Okay, so the next thing we started to talk about was, was probability, right? So suppose we have 3% of the population in a given community of adults has, has attempted suicide. Suppose it is known that 20% of the community are living below the poverty line. If these two events are independent, in other words, living below the poverty line has nothing to do with the likelihood that you would commit suicide, right? That's independent. The two factors have no relationship, okay? Uh, if these two events are independent, what is the probability that a person selected at random from the community will have attempted suicide and be living below the poverty line? Rather than asking for a number, first, uh, can you tell me how you would calculate that? The probability of committing, uh, attempting suicide is 3%. The probability of being uh, in the, uh, 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 below the poverty level is 20%, 0.03 and 0.2. Yes. Would you multiply? Exactly right. You would multiply the two of them together, right? But you can only justify that if they are independent events, right? If, it's, if, if being below the poverty level makes you more likely to attempt suicide, now you can't do that anymore, right? So if I were to tell you that we did a large survey and we found, what does that come out to? Uh, 0 0.03 times 0 0.2 is, comes out to 0 0.06, 0 0.006, right? 0 0.006, right? Uh, six tenths of a percent. If I told you that we did a very large survey in this community and we found that uh, uh, the probability of having attempted suicide and being in the uh, uh, below the poverty level is 1.3%. What would that tell you about that? It would tell you that those two variables are not independent. There's some association there, right? If I told you it's 0 0.01, 0.001%, right, a tenth of a percent, that would also tell you that they're not associated, but maybe because you're less likely to commit suicide rather than more likely to commit suicide. Yes. Oh, three, three percent. 
right, 0.03, 0.2, right, 0 0.20. So 0 0.03, yeah, 0 0.006, right, right, right. Just count up the number that, you know, but it's two decimal places, one decimal place. So you get the answer and, and you move it over three decimal places. Okay, so refer to the table below. What proportion of women? Question because you're talking about the independence and that thing. Yes. Um, in one of the questions you had asked in the framework, so 60% of the population is leaving high school. And then you said you took three, repeated three, and only 22% of the time the three subjects graduate high school. So wouldn't that show that then? Back, yeah, the back up again. Read it, read it for me again. It, it's from 60% of the population has completed high school. Okay, I want to repeat that here for these guys. 60% okay. of the population has completed high school. Yep. Okay, you take repeated samples of size 3 from this population and find that about 22% of the time all three subjects have graduated okay. high school. Okay, okay, let's think about that. If that's true, that 60% of the population has completed high school, right? Um, uh, 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 now, if I were to take a, if I would take three people and try and, and ask you, what's the likelihood that three randomly selected people uh, had completed high school, given that 60% of the population had completed high school, what's the probability all three of them would have completed high school? So how would we calculate that? Okay, uh, we're, um, we're getting out. Okay. Yeah, okay, let me just answer that question. I'll get out. Set up and you're welcome to keep going to like 550. She's oh. going to be setting up. Oh, I'm sorry. So we, we're okay you here can, for. No, what I'm saying is you can stay here and keep going. I just I don't have someone actually setting up. So I hope it's. It, oh, okay. If, if it works for you, that's not too distracting. That's fine. But oh, I that's need fine. Room ready. Yeah. I'm a bigger right. distraction than they are. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at any rate, at any rate, um, um, but so point six, don't worry about us. We'll be okay. So, so 0.6 is going to be uh, the probability of one person randomly selected uh, 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 having graduated high school is 0.6. The second person is going to be 0.6. The third person is going to be 0.6. It's going to be 0.6 times 0.6 times 0.6, just like flipping a coin. It's going to be 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 if it's a random selection, right? So what would you expect the probability that all three would have graduated high school? 0.6 times 0.6 is 0.36, right? Somebody got a calculator? To multiply that by 0.6 again. What is it? 0.216. Okay, so now let's say you do that one time, right? You do it one time, it's not going to tell you much because you might just get lucky and find all three and you might, you know, might get some other guy, you know, combination. But what if you did a sample of three over and over and over and over again, you would get many results, right? Many times that you repeated this over and over and over again. The percentage of time that you would get all three having graduated high school is exactly what we just described, 21.6%. And since that's the, that's the result that you got, you know your sample was random and independent. But if your repeated samples of size three come out to be 40%, something's wrong. It was either not random or the samples were not really independent. Maybe you sampled the, you know, maybe by mistake you showed up on at a, at a function the day that they were having a high school reunion, so all the people that graduated were there on that day. In other words, maybe there's some reason it wasn't independent. So it should it should be the same percentage as you would predict given that probability. Okay, refer to the table below. What portion, what proportion, I'm going to go to 545 because we started, you know, about 445. What proportion of women have made more than one visit to the obstetrician's office during an uncomplicated pregnancy? So 20% of the women never visited the obstetrician's office. 20% of, of uh, percent of women went once, 5% went twice, and 1% went three times. Instead of having, I like that, that's very nice. We'll have to borrow that someday. And to the, uh, <laughs> I'm just kibitzing. Don't listen. To me. Um, instead of instead of giving you a, a set number, a um, hundred women went none, uh, didn't go at all, or uh, say twenty women didn't go at all. Twenty women went once. Thirty women, fifty women went twice, and ten women went 
once, instead of giving you a number, they're just giving it the percentage of the population. But you can use that the same way that you would use all this other, you know, all the regular numbers. So it asks you, what proportion of women made more than one visits to the obstetrician's office? What's the total percentage here? It's 100%, right? One, right? Okay. What percentage of women made more than one visit? So what qualifies as more than one visit? Yeah, two and three. So 60% out of 100% made more than one visit, or in other words, just 60%. Okay? Okay, so a little bit of a twist on just working with the absolute numbers. They gave it to you as percentages instead. Scores on the psychomotor development index, a scale of infant development that were approximately normally distributed with 100 standard deviation and a standard deviation of 15. An infant is selected at random. What's the probability that the infant's PBI score exceeds 103? Well, now this is the stuff that we just got into recently, right? Because we started talking about normal distributions and the, the, uh, 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 the idea that uh, uh, the empirical uh, rule that tells us roughly where all the different levels, all the different areas in a normal distribution represented by standard deviation are. So this is the kind of place where it's really good to draw this stuff. Okay, now I don't have my pen set up and I don't want to kill a lot of time, so I'm going to just draw it with my notepad. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, first thing is, let's take a look at what the distribution is. Um, um, uh, the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. So this distribution would look something like this. And forgive me for actually I'm kind of doing it better with my trackpad, I guess. So this is 100. The number's not going to be so good. And the standard deviation is 15. So looking at the areas, what we're interested in is what percentage of the infants did better than 103. Okay, so here's 103. Oh, three. Okay, so now this is a little bit quick. We, we took a little bit of a jump here because we skipped past the empirical rule, right? We went right to the uh, right to the actual calculation of z-scores and stuff. This is the area we're interested. In. That area represents the percentage of infants that does the score bigger than 103. So we need to know what's the z-score that's represented from 100. How many standard deviations above the mean is 103? So z is going to be equal to Right, that C is going to be equal to 103 minus 100 over 15. So what is it going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to, it's going to be 3 over 15 is going to be 0 0.2 plus, right, it's positive because 103 is bigger than 100, plus 0 0.3. Well, now we have a number of options. One of the options is go to our T table, our Z table, right? Our crusty T table. That's the one I like to use. And we know that this T table has two sides to it. Whoops. Did I cause a problem there? Oops. A crusty Z table, Z. I guess the Z table, I should have said. Right? That's the Z scores, the areas that are represented by the Z scores. Okay, so now we see that on the left side of the uh, mean, the, the middle of this distribution, the Z scores are all negative. On the right side, they become positive. Right? Okay, so we're looking for 0 0.020. 0 0.020. If it would have been point zero, if it had come out to 0 0.23, we would have gone across to th the column for 0.03 and said that 0.023 is, represents 59.1%. Uh, uh, but 0.02 is just 5793, 5793.5793. So this area, it, this area from here down, right, it only gives you the area from that point down, is 0.5, I'm going to call it 0.58. It's really 5793, but I'm going to call it 0.58. So what does that what does that leave for this area? One minus that, or 0.42. 42 percent of the infants did better than 103. I I went to the chart. 
I, I looked up the Z score for 0 .02, 0 .02, 0.02, it, uh, well, we saw, right? Yeah. So, so remember, we look. We want to know how many standard deviations above the mean is 103, right? Take take a quick look up here. How many standard deviations above the mean is 103? So 103 is three above the mean. Three. The standard deviation is 15. So it's only one fifth of a standard deviation above the mean. And how did I calculate that? I took the value I'm interested in, 103, I'll call that x, minus the mean over the standard deviation. That's 100 minus, uh, 103 minus 100 over 15, so that came out to be 0 0.02. 0 0.02, right? 0 0.02 is right? 0.02. I tried to write 0 0.02 over there, I think, and kind of, remember, I'm writing, with, I'm writing with my finger here. Yeah, 0.02. Right? 0 0.02 on positive side. So notice that the area is bigger than 50%. It comes out to be 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.5793. I rounded it to 0 0.58, right, for our, for our purposes here. 0 0.58, so that leaves 0 0.42. If I had asked what percentage were below 103, you could have stopped right here and said it was 0.58%. So the answer is 0.42. 0 0.42, yeah. Because then you take one minus. Exactly. The whole area is one or 100%. So one minus point six. Yeah. What's the probability that the infant's PDI score is between 97 and 103? Well, 97 is going to be on the other side of the mean, right? So this is 97. But 97, 97 minus 100 is 3 over 15 right, over 15, is now going to be negative 0.2, negative 0.2, right? So if I go back to my chart, to my Z table, right, negative just means it's on the left side, right? Negative just means it's on the left side of the mean. So 0.2 standard deviations below the mean is 42%. Oh, what a surprise. Notice it's symmetrical, right? Okay. Okay, so in fact, some charts, some charts don't give you two pages. They only give you one. Could make you figure out that it's symmetrical. Okay, so now this area in here is 42%. This area, you know, because we went from this point down, right? This area up here is 42%. So now the question is, how many children are between 97 and 103? Well, we accounted for 42% above 103. We accounted for 42% below 97, so that adds, adds up to 84%, so that leaves 16% in between, that are in that range in between. Okay. Now, if you look at it this way, just think about those areas and sketch it, you can, you, you, you'll be able to come up with the answer for any of these, no matter how complicated we make the numbers. It's exactly the same kind of procedure. Just remember, what you get from the table is going to be from that point down, right? Positive numbers are going to be on the left side, so they're going to be more than 50% area. Negative numbers are going to be on the right side, less than 50%. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's on, it's on, it's on uh, one of the sessions and stuff like that. And I'll make sure in the exam that you have all the tables that you need together. But you can use anything on Blackboard, anything we link to on Blackboard. You can't communicate with each other, and you can't just go search the Internet for answers like YouTube or something like that. I, you know, unfortunately, an online course is an honor thing, right? So I can't, I can't monitor what you're doing, but, but uh, I'm hoping that you'll do it on your own. Okay, so let's call it a night, and then we'll pick up from here.